What's the address of your emergency? Um, I'm actually camping in Red Horse, just outside of Red Horse. Uh huh. Um, my two year old son, um, we can't find him. How long has he been missing? About four hours. Yeah. Are you by water? Yes. Do you know which campground you're in? Uh, Timber Creek. Hold on. We need search and rescue. News in Idaho Falls is kind of slow. Not a lot of big things happen here. I had only been here a few weeks when this case, the biggest story of my career, happened. But it just didn't make sense that to not find anything uh, footprints, uh, pieces of flesh, pieces of clothing. Well, it's, it's troubling. You know, I got, you know, members of my search and rescue unit that aren't sleeping too well. This is a small town in Idaho called Ledore. It's remote. Your cell phone is going in and out. You're on a gravel road at first, but then it turns very rocky. And when I say rocky, I mean big boulders. You could drive maybe five miles an hour and that's safe. And it's just real rocky. It takes a long time to travel the short distance from the town of the door to the campground. Well, once you leave the pavement, I think it's a little over seven miles of uh, a pretty rough road. Once you reach the campsite to where they were at, the Timber Creek campground, it kind of just dead ends. And you get out, and there's the campsite. There's a table, there's a fire pit. 10, 20 feet away, there's a steep hill that goes to the creek. It's a combination of uh, willowy, swampy creek bottoms, uh, steep hillsides, some of them uh, sagebrush, some of them timber, a lot of rock. They arrived at the campground late on the evening of July 9th, Thursday evening. It was very late, it was dark. They say they instantly went to bed. From day one, law enforcement told us that all of the people at the campsite were considered persons of interest just because they were simply there. Dior Sr. and Jessica Mitchell, the parents of young Dior, uh, grandpa, Jessica's grandpa, and another man named Isaac Renwand, who was a friend of Grandpa, who apparently at the last minute decided to go camping with them. It was dark when they got there. Dior said they parked the truck, parked the trailer, and the Suburban. Isaac pitched his tent. They got Grandpa settled in the camp trailer. They slept in the back of the Suburban, got up the next morning, and he, then he realized how rural it was. You know, they were basically at the end of the road. Thought it was a pretty safe place, you know? Cliffs on all, kind of all the way around, not really any way for him to get out, you know? The next morning, July 10th, Friday, they wake up, they're hanging around the campsite. They had gone into Ledor to the store because Jessica needed feminine products. They went in there and they bought, you know, just that stuff and then some candy and stuff for a little man. Jessica goes to the bathroom as the boy's being loaded up, and they return to the campground. So when they get to the campground, uh, this Isaac and the grandfather, Bob, said, we got some fish, and he showed the fish to Dior, and Dior supposedly says, I don't believe you caught those fish in the stream there. I can't believe it. Show me where you got them. So Jessica and Dior, with this Isaac, 
built towards the creek, which is maybe 100 feet away. They say to little Dior, do you want to come with us? According to law enforcement, little Dior follows them for a point, but then turns around and goes back. The parents continue on assuming that grandpa is watching Dior. And Jessica tells me she keeps looking back over her shoulder to make sure the little boy's not following them. And uh, when she was confident he wasn't following, they went to the two spots along the creek where they supposedly caught the fish. Well, they went down there probably 10, 15 minutes, and then they saw minnows. And they were going to go back to camp and get Little Man because he loves fish, like he loves bugs, stuff like that. And so they went back up there, and Dior looks at Bob and says, where's little Dior? And Bob says he was right here. Where's little Dior? And Grandpa says, well, he's right there. Of course, he's not there. Grandfather claims he didn't go inside his trailer. Well, I believe he did. Police say that Isaac Renwand at this time is down at the creek fishing. They say they panic. They do a search of the immediate campground. They, they look wherever they can. Craziness started, everybody's, I mean, they started yelling, they started searching. They searched for about 15 to 20 minutes. No sign of them. Dennis decided they better call 911. It's a remote area, you can't get cell phone service. Jessica says miraculously she got a signal. Um, my two-year-old son, um, we can't find him. Dior hops in his truck, goes down the road to see if he can get better service. Both, I mean, both of them are on the phone with 911 at the same time. You know, my son's missing, can you help us? and then it's just all been chaos from there. Good evening, everyone. You're in the right place at the right time. This is Coast to Coast AM. Tonight, we plunge once again into the deep end of the paranormal pool. Hundreds of people vanished from our national parks and forests, some right under the noses of parents or family members, under very unusual but very similar circumstances. Dave Blytis, welcome back to the program. Well, thanks for having me, George. All right, Dave, I want to jump right into this. Dior Kuntz, two years old. I mean, you were a cop. If you were investigating this case, uh, abduction is one of the least likely events, right? I, I would probably say yes. And the reason for that is, is that the family was in a campground deep into the mountains. There was one very rocky, rough road going in and the same road out. If someone would have driven into that area, you would think that the family would have heard them. And if they would have walked up to the campsite, they for sure would have been seen. It's like it's like in so many of the other cases, it's like he's plucked out of the sky. It's like just snatched out of the sky. That case is very reminiscent of a case that happened decades earlier, just outside of Estes Park, Colorado. St. Malo is, is uh, particularly for Catholics, it's one of the most visited places in the Estes Valley. Up on the hill, you have the Statue of Christ. And then right below that is St. Catherine's Chapel. The story of St. Malo's is really wonderful. It goes back to uh, a man named Father Joseph Bassetti, uh, who was a, a Catholic priest. One day in 1916, uh, he came up to the Hosa Valley uh, and he and two or three others were camping on the slopes of Mount Meeker uh, when they saw uh, a meteor in the sky. Uh, they got up, uh, 
wandered toward the meteor, hoping they'd found where it came down, and ended up standing on the rock where St. Catherine's Chapel is located. And Father Bassetti said, this would be a good place for a boys' camp, and the rest is history. I'm the caretaker here at uh, St. Catherine of Siena's Chapel on the Rock. This was built 1935 as a chapel for camp kids through all those years. Lots of camp kids came here. In 1973, I came up here and became a camp counselor at Camp St. Malo and loved the outdoors. Every week, the kids would go on hikes. We have an easy, medium, and hard hike. And we'd have bonfire and lodge night where we did skits and sang songs. And the camaraderie was awesome. It's August. It's a warm summer month. Bobby Bicep was a 10-year-old camper. He was partially deaf, wore a hearing aid and he liked to fish. Well, on August 15th at about 6 p.m., Bobby was fishing in the small creek behind the retreat when a counselor approached him and told him it was dinner time. Bobby acknowledged the counselor and started to follow him downhill towards the retreat. As the counselor was walking back, he turned behind him to look and Bobby was gone. And that's when the search started. St. Mallow Retreat and the summer camp is right on the border of Rocky Mountain National Park. Within four days, there were 400 searchers from the National Park Service, local sheriffs, volunteers, and SAR experts. Officials were difficult to understand how Bobby could get lost because it's straight downhill on a very defined trail to the retreat. During the height of the search, the Civil Air Patrol dropped 5,000 leaflets over 200 square miles which were telling Bobby that his parents loved him and they needed him. On August 25th, the formal search was terminated after a nine-day effort. Now, there were three counselors that were looking for Bobby that entire time, and the following year, they returned. And one day, they walked up the side of Mount Mika right through the boulder field, about 2,000 feet up from the retreat, and saw a hearing aid and bits of clothing. They found Bobby Bicep's remains. And they found him in a ravine up on the face of Mount Meeker, which is right here along Cabin Creek, he was in the ravine that they had searched at least three times the year before. Make no mistake, Bobby could not have been lost. Uphill to Meeker is an exhausting and treacherous hike in spots. Downhill to the retreat is dinner and an easy hike. You mentioned that Bobby is hearing impaired. When you look at the big picture and the number of cases that you have investigated, the fact that he's impaired it's almost as if that's one of the factors on why they're targeted. And George, that's an interesting point. It seems as though an abnormal number of these people disappear with some type of physical impairment or genetic deficiency. So Bobby's case happened August 15th, 1958. These go back decades, but even today it's happening as we speak. It's the third night in Idaho Falls family is spending without their son. More than 10,000 man hours have been put into trying to find a missing toddler in Lemhi County. A lot of facts didn't add up. I just, I, I don't know. The day before it's a disappearance that has many scratching their heads. 10 miles west of Ledor, this campground was the last place anyone saw two-year-old Dior Kuntz Jr. Child that age. 75% of them are found within four tenths of a mile of the place last seen. And you look at the terrain and it's extremely rugged, but they can go further than you think would be reasonable. And what kind of 
resources would you guys deploy? Um, I sent a deputy up there, uh, activated search and rescue. The sheriff, within a, a few hours, we have several searchers who are searching for this boy, and they can't find him. We uh, used dogs to start with, some ground searchers to start with. Uh, the helicopter come in, top notch crew. I mean, they have FLIR, which is forward looking infrared for night. This is all these guys do is this, this type of stuff search and rescue. Spread everybody out in one long chain, as wide as we can get. I mean, if we're hilltop to hilltop, we're going to try to cover every little nook and cranny. Every log, rock, anything that looks turned over, check it out. I was 90 to 100 miles an hour driving around people, you know, just acting like a maniac to get up there. I thought, you know, it's going to be really foolish when I get up there and get out of the car and he's right there. And, you know, I got out of the car and that wasn't what happened. You know, everyone said, take five steps, look up, look down, look around. Take five steps, look up, look down and around. And that's what we do. I mean, it. Yeah, there's a lot of area up there. There's people everywhere. I mean, there's 200 plus searchers up there the day after he went missing on Saturday. You know, there's there, there's people everywhere. Maybe he fell into the creek. That creek search and rescue crews went through on their hands and feet with poles, literally crawling through that creek. Nothing. They supposedly check uh, wolf dens, they check uh, bear den, they check eagle nests because an eagle could pick up, you know, 30 pounds. Little Dior weighed approximately 27, 28 pounds. There are bears in the area. There's bobcats, there's uh, mountain lions, there's other animals. But there would be some sort of, of uh, clothing or a bone or something, you would think. There's no clothing, there's no uh, flesh or anything that would indicate that an animal got them. There's no blood, there's nothing there. You know, you'd think you would find something, you know. And then you, you're talking about the trace you're looking for. Well, maybe a boot came off. Well, they were camouflaged cowboy boots. You know, the thing of it is, everything they're eating that time of year is that tall, you know. Same size as him. It's possible. This little boot is similar. Actually, this is the exact boot, maybe just a couple sizes bigger that Dior was wearing the day he went missing. Um, I can tell you from experience that these boots don't stay on real good. Um, my grandson kicks them off in the car seat every time we put him in there. They were too big for him, so they were sloppy, and he was clumsy anyway when he would walk. He would just walk clumsily. Uh, somebody picked him up, the car boot was would have fallen off his feet. So if these were the boots that Dior was wearing that day and they were too big, Certainly, if an animal would have grabbed him, even if somebody else had abducted him, I think we would have found something. The boots, his jacket, something would be found up there. We went for three or four days without any sleep, and you know, I got to the point where I was, I was an emotional mess. You gotta have a twofold investigation. You gotta think the search, that's good. Then you can't find anything, then you start focusing on the parents. Then you focus on people who else were in the camper on at the time. And so now they're coming down hard on Jessica and Dior, try to play one against the other to see if one's gonna tell. Law enforcement continually told us that all of the individuals were being cooperative. They were all questioned individually and together and that they were working with them. There wasn't any sort of uh, red flag that the police were saying that were pointing them toward one specific individual. You know, I've had to grab her by the hand and go for walks with her and say, you, you just have to promise me if there's anything that's going on, you gotta talk to me, you gotta tell me, you know, and, and those conversations have, have been very clear and straightforward and she's come back and said, Mom, I don't know why you're doing this to me. I didn't have anything to do with this. Dior Sr. and Jessica Mitchell, the parents of young Dior, came into our studios and 
looked upset. They looked like they had been wearing the same clothing that they were wearing when they were camping. A uh, hoodie. Uh, she was carrying Dior's blanket. It was dirty. It was ragged. It hadn't been washed. And a teddy bear, one of his little toys. We sat down, and as I do with any interview, uh, especially with a distraught parent, you want to show compassion and kindness, but you also want to find out if they, they might have anything to do with, with his disappearance. Um, all right, Dior, so take us back. Was it Friday? Yes. I'm not sure what day it is today. Yeah, today's yeah. Monday. It was Friday. It was Friday. Friday at about 2, 2.26 is when I, was it 2.26? It was 2.36 when I called. Two, it was 2.36 is when she called, and I was in the truck hauling down to the road to try and get service because I didn't think one bar would get it. We, we, we were just, yeah, we decided we were going to go a little exploring. He was going to be good with Grandpa by the campfire. We were at more than probably 50, 50 yards away in 10 minutes. Uh, well, but the time we, I seen him to the point I figured out he was gone. And the creek was empty. The, the creek, they there was moved, nothing. They had chainsaws um, moving because every few feet it was blocked down and blocked off from off. Na nature, from trees, from branches, from right. debris. Was, I mean, there was a lot of places that he could be, and that's what they wanted to eliminate. That was my biggest concern. And if he's not, where, where we is were he? Because by. that means that there's a chance he's still alive, and that's all I need is a chance to know that he's still alive. And I, until I have him and closure or him, I would know nothing is stopping. Nothing is. Do you know, did somebody have a vendetta against you? I mean, do you, I, I'm sure We've you've gone through your mind. We've been racking our brains. We have been racking our brains, and I don't know anybody that doesn't have a few people that either you like you or you hate you. But, I but don't, not to harm a two-year-old, almost three-year-old. Not three to harm old. us this way, especially Hard. knowing how much he, he means to us. He's everything to us. How long have you guys been? You're married? No, we're actually yeah. getting married next month. Oh. I saw the rings and didn't know if it was engagement or... Engagement. How long have you been together? Almost Pop quiz. five years. Yeah. Jessica's always been very, very reserved. She does not like to let people see her emotionally. Yeah, she is quiet. And he's the one that's more dynamic, he does. Maybe might say proud to a fault. You know, the 911 call that she made, everyone kept saying, you know, why was it that she was so calm? Um, I'm actually camping in Red Ore, just outside of Red Ore. Uh-huh. Um, my two-year-old son, um, we can't find him. I know they need money. I know they owe a lot of money in Montpelier, a lot of money for child care. And I know that she had her tubes tied and singed so she could never have a reverse, never have another child. And I think she did that because she didn't want children. But there was evidence that she was, uh, had a hard time beating with kids. She would leave her kid at daycare and leave them unattended many times. And I've talked to many people that, uh, that brought that out. She has two kids from her ex-husband. And every other weekend they come, they go to her house for the weekend. Seemed like good kids, still think they are good kids. Um, they're hurting bad. Um, I've held Dior wife while he's cried. After we finished the interview, I said, well, I hope he's found today. I hope he'll be, I hope you find him today. And then that night, I saw them again at a vigil. You're the God of all comfort, Lord, that you would comfort the heart of of Jessica and Dior and, and Trina Lord. He could be very, very close. He could be very far away. We don't know, but we are covering all bases at this point. There's not much to be said other than one small mistake as a parent. You know, I, I'm leaving him with an, a, an adult that turns his head for a minute. They move, they go. Please cherish and love each other because it could be changed in a, just a split second. And they said that they were leaving from the vigil to go back up to the campsite to continue to search.
Basically what we would do is pick an area where we would like to hike and explore. And so when we went along Big South Trail for the first time, gorgeous hike, beautiful, beautiful river. You know, this is really a wild area and, uh, and the reason why Gary and I so much enjoy hiking together. And then it was just coincidental that, you know, we wound up in a rock field and said, you know, let's hike up the ridge. And I think it's about uh, a 2,000 foot hike up elevation to get to the top of it. But really remarkable country. Yeah, okay, well, pretty much it was like a, almost a scramble. Okay, so you're watching your feet and basically you just focused a few feet in front of your own feet so you don't, you know, twist the ankles. Or and that's when I saw the shoe. It was pretty pristine. It was like somebody had just took the foot right out of it, you know. It was so fresh, I thought like I would see a kid standing in front of me. Jesus. And what's your name? Jared. Give me that big smile with the dimples. Yeah. It wasn't so much that he liked the Raiders. He loved silver and black. And when he saw the Raiders on TV one day, he's like, yeah, there's a silver and black team. I said, yeah, there is. That's my team, Dad. I'm like, okay. So he's a Raiders fan. My name is Jocelyn Adadero, and my brother Jared Adadero went missing in the Colorado mountains in 1999. As I was younger, my dad will tell me that I would tell him certain memories I had of the hike. As I got older, though, I couldn't even tell you what I told him back then. I, the only memory I have of the resort or that that whole time period is after Jared had disappeared. We were back at the resort in a room. I couldn't, I couldn't even tell you where. And my dad was kneeling on the ground crying and I was hugging him. I was attracted to the Poudre Canyon because, you know, the trees were beautiful. And you know there's stuff out there, but it's just interesting because you become part of the Poudre Canyon right there. It was approximately 10 acre resort. It was small, but you know, we kept busy. It was all about just being there. It was one of those situations where when you actually owned the little store there, we got up at six o'clock in the morning and we closed at 11 o'clock at night. Not only did it take care of us, but how many people get the opportunity to be next to their kids 24 seven? And I, that's what I really enjoyed about the canyon. There, there were only three of us. I mean, even though we had a family at the resort, we had people that worked for us, it was Jocelyn, Jared, and I. We knew that we were the family. The group decided they wanted to go to the trout farm, a uh, fishery right, right around the corner, maybe about a mile and a half, two miles from the resort itself. Several of the people that I knew quite well. So I, I gave permission for Jocelyn to go, not knowing that Jared would be saying, gee, Dad, if she can go, why can't I go too? He had his shoes on. He hate to tie his shoes, so I didn't make him tie his shoes. And he had like a beige color jacket. Have fun, okay? Don't get too close to the water. I let Jared go, and I assumed that's where they were going. Could you describe the trail? Moderate, ups, downs. You could take a kid on it as long as you kept the kid in line and hung onto him. Because there were some areas where the ledges were only 24 inches wide and you had loose shale all the way down to the river. So, and then there was rock fields. Being a moderate trail, it's pretty tough. It can, if you're not in shape, it'll take, take it out on you. The church group, went up to the Big South Trail, they parked at the trailhead, and they started walking in on the trail. They started to separate or spread out as they walked in, some people faster and slower. Um, one adult with Jared's sister and Jared seemed to be out ahead of everybody else. As Jared, as a three-year-old, is is running and playing and having a good time. 
And I believe there was something 10 to 20 minutes worth of time that she lost track. Um, the adult realized I haven't seen him for a while. And when they went up to try to find him, they kept going thinking they would catch up, and they didn't catch up. It was reported that he spoke to some fishermen, and he asked if there were bears around. And he's alone at this point in time. At least they have an idea of, you know, roughly where he was last seen. I myself was cleaning some things and decided to uh, sit down and watch a football game. And I must have been watching for maybe 15 or 20 minutes and I slowly nodded off. Something's wrong. And they're like, Alan, we have to talk to you. Sure, you know, you know what, what's going on? And they said, um, uh, we had a problem with Jared. Well, what happened? Did he fall? Did he? You know, scrape his knee, did he break his arm, what happened? And what they actually said to me was, he's okay, we just can't find him. At that moment, I realized I had to go up the road. We got in our cars and I was in my truck. And I'm like, well, where are we going? They said it's about, I can't remember, 16, 15, 16 miles up the road. And I'm like, are you serious? How'd you guys get up that far up the road? And the entire way, up the road, I just kept beating myself in the chest like someone had stuck me with a sword. Just beating my chest and yelling and yelling Jared's name, yelling, God, yelling for God to help me. Please help me find my son, Lord. Just yelling and screaming. I yelled and screamed in my truck all the way up the road. I don't even know how I got there. I drove that road probably twice as fast as anyone should even drive that road. And as I ran up that trail, I yelled and yelled and screamed his name and screamed Jared, screamed J-Rod. I called him J-Rod. I called him my little man. Um, call, I called every name I could, trying to get a response from him. And I listened. And I'm not sure exactly how far we got up on the trail, but I stopped and I realized, oh my God, this is gonna be, this, this is not what I thought it was. I, I just can't get up here and find him. We worked for solid eight days to begin with. Uh, and that was uh, 20, uh, 24 hours a day for eight days. It's important to keep visual contact at all times. We did, uh, some night searching was limited to a certain extent, but we did always have people out in the field to uh, make noise. So if somebody was out there and uh, Jared would have heard it, he would have maybe responded or went to him. It was very intense, uh, very media friendly. I mean, there was media, CNN, and so it became a real nationwide uh, episode. So that put a lot of stress on us and a lot of stress on the dogs. It was a situation to where people lost hope. It's like, we're not gonna find him, you know. It's, this is one of those situations where he disappeared. We had hiked the area a couple of times before and we had talked about uh, the mystery of Jared Darrow, whether he had been swept downstream, abducted by a, uh, a mountain lion or if there had been something more sinister than that. Uh, this time we went, decided to go off trail and we just walked right into it and uh, uh, and we knew right away that it was probably Jared Adadero's clothes. You 
Is there any way Jared could have climbed up to that spot on his own? Not. No boy, way. That's a hard one. No uh, way. No way. I, Absolutely no way. Not all the way. No, I could see him going. See, he lived in a he's cabin a, in the He's Poudre. a three-year-old. There's no yeah. way. Yeah, I, there is I no way that would happen. Mm, yeah. Not all the way. I mean, it was a struggle for Gary and Eddie. Yeah. yeah. Very rough terrain. There were canine alerts that would go that direction. Now, whether they were right at the scree field or before it, but they were at least alerting up that hill. That's why I'm reasonably certain we searched it because we, when a dog alerts like that, we're thinking, okay, something must be up there. Let's get up there and search for it. Um, but we never found anything. I think whatever is happening is beyond our understanding. And in a lot of these cases, search and rescue or the volunteers searching people have already gone over certain areas, not once, not twice, but even dozens of times. And then the child is found there maybe a year, maybe a few years later. When we had discovered the clothes and went back up there with some of the people involved in the search, you know, they were all scratching their heads like, you know, they had all been around uh, the area. Uh, my conclusion was an animal encounter uh, right at the beginning. And um, so um, I'm not sure officially what has really been released as a finality, uh, but um, it pretty much points to an animal encounter. And if a cat actually took him, which is what I believe, I believe happened, uh, the cat would have taken him someplace and, and buried him and with all of the activity that was going on, probably would have left because we would have scared it away and, and it would have came back later. I hear constantly about a mountain lion. Yet, when they tested Jared's clothing, there was no mountain lion hairs, no DNA, no blood, nothing on his clothing. This is actually what's left of the cranium after four different DNA tests. To, to think that I, I mean, I have a hard time comprehending this, but to think that I'm actually sitting here holding my son. But this is, this is what I have left of him. The clothing was sent to the CBI. The clothing was tested by the CBI. No mountain lion hairs, no blood, nothing on any of the articles of clothing. If a mountain lion would have attacked him, they go for the stomach area. And this jacket would have been in shreds. I've been told by several people, mountain lion experts in the works, this jacket would not have survived a mountain lion attack, period. These are the actual shoes. These are Jared's shoes that were found up on the mountain. I've been told by experts that they do not look like they've been in the wilderness for three and a half years. The other thing that's interesting about the shoes is you would think that if a mountain lion were dragging his body up a mountain and dragging him like this, you would see marks on his shoes, and there are no marks there. You would think if he was dragging them this way up a mountain, not only would you see marks, but it would have pulled his shoes off way before the area where they found him. Jared's pants were found inside out. Um, when people first see this, they get terrified and they look at it and go, oh my gosh, what, what could have happened to him? There were birds and rodents and stuff literally pulling it apart using the material as nesting so you see this material everywhere so it's not because something attacked him and ripped his leg mm -hmm. off this is all due to um, rodents and birds yeah we were relieved in in one sense that uh, the mystery had been solved my sense of it is that uh, jared jared was abducted in the in the boulder field by the mountain lion. The mountain lion grabbed him by his shoulder and went straight up the this, this side of this mountain. In one of the reports, 
the person says, well, the reason why you didn't find any DNA or blood or anything on Jared's clothing is because either he or something removed his clothing before he was attacked. Either Jared or something removed his clothing before he was attacked. And they go on to say that because there are so many hikers coming up, the mountain lion took Jared's body 500 feet up the, up the side of the cliff. Well, wait a second. I can buy all that, but I can't buy this. If something or someone took Jared's clothing off before he was attacked, that means his clothing wasn't with him when this thing carried him up the mountain. Jared's pants were found inside out, told by many mountain lion experts. Mountain lions don't pull clothing off of you, especially your pants, and leave them there on the mountain inside out. There's just too much. There are too many questions that don't have answers. And I feel strongly, my family and I feel strongly that there is someone out there who knows a little bit more than we know. You know, when I get questioned about this from people who've heard our interviews, uh, people will stick to that. It's a bear, it's a mountain lion, it's some kind of an animal. But I mean, they leave clues, there's evidence, there's blood, there's tissue, there's indications of a struggle, right? Oh, absolutely, and when the trackers come in with search and rescue, they're looking for those indicators. There's gonna be a massive scene there of blood, hair, drag marks and things as the animal would be taking you away. That's one of the points that we vet before we even look into one of these cases. And in the last 100 years, there's only been 14 fatal mountain lion attacks in the United States and Canada. Could you tell us where we are and who you are? Idaho Falls, Idaho, and Robert C. Walton. What was a day like with little Dior? I didn't play with him much. He was just getting to the point where he could do something, you know. He was over here quite a bit with Jessica, and he'd come over here and bum candy off me. I know this is a tough question. Do you feel any guilt about it? Well, <clears throat> sure, I think a little, but I think everybody who was there has a little guilt about it, you know? Dior and Jessica say that they decided to go camping that weekend to kind of relive uh, good memories for Grandpa, Bob Walton. This was apparently a spot that in his earlier years, Bob Walton had gone to several times. Grandpa is on oxygen. Some have said has some memory issues. Law enforcement since day one have continually ruled out Grandpa because of his health issues and they don't think he was in the right frame of mind to do anything like this. With my dad being ill, I asked Jessica to go up there to be with him in the event that something happened to my father that she could take care of him. I don't know Bob and I've never met Isaac, but being the only other two people there, other than Jessica and Dior. If he was taken from that campground, they have to be involved somehow. Since Dior Kuntz disappeared, many have had questions about the friend who was with the family that day at the campsite. His name is Isaac Renwand. So we went to his Idaho Falls house over and over Hello. and over again. Finally, early Monday morning, he answered the door. I'm Nate Eaton with East Idaho News. Yeah, I don't have any questions. I'm sorry. You don't have anything you want to say? No. All right, sorry to wake you up. We just want to see if you have anything to say about Dior missing. I, I don't. You don't? I have no comment. So he was just with you and the grandfather when he wandered away? Mm-hmm. And then you guys thought he was with the parents? Yeah. And the parents came back and he was gone? Mm-hmm. Like I said, I don't have, I don't, I can't, I don't want to answer any more questions or anything. Thank you, sir. Strange thing about Isaac, he never searched for the boy. I interviewed Isaac. He's a strange duck. 
And uh, he does have a, a prior conviction of a sex crime. <clears throat> it was reduced from a felony down to a misdemeanor. And the strange thing is the morning after he was, the little boy was missing, he got up and said to several people, boy, it's the best night's rest I had in a long time. The parents told me that they had never met Isaac until this camping trip. That grandpa said, oh, I'm going to bring along a friend. We're going to fish together. Um, we'll have a, a fun weekend away together. And the parents were OK with that. Isaac, who's, who's Bob Walton? Bob Walton? That's one of my good friends that I met him when I lived over on Chamberlain Avenue. Uh, I've known him for about five years or so. He's always tried to help me out, been there, I've done work for him in his yard. He's always taken me on fishing trips every year, so I decided I wanted to go this year too because, you know, it's fun. And it was nice and clear, hot. I don't know, it was noisy because of the creek. But other than that, it was, it was a wonderful day. There wasn't really a cloud in the sky. Could you tell me a little bit about the events leading up to little Dior's disappearance? Not too much, only that I was fishing. Isaac was watching me, and he got all excited after I'd caught a couple, and he was going to get his pole out. I think we caught four or five. About that time, here come Jess and Dior back. I don't know. I think it was about noon, maybe a little after. They had to go down to get some gas for the truck, and they came back. So Isaac and Jessica and Dior was, they went to look for a fish, and the kid was there with me, but I turned my head for a minute, I don't know how long, five, ten minutes, I don't know. The grandfather claims he didn't go inside his trailer, but I believe he did. I believe he did go inside the trailer. I showed them a couple of fishing holes. I went down to another fishing hole. I was probably down there a half an hour, an hour, and. I looked to the right of me where they were in a, where they were fishing, and I noticed their fishing poles laying there on the ground, and they weren't there. And then here come Dior, over his words, little Dior, and I says, "Well, he's right there, you know." And then I seen my friend Bob up on the ridge, and so I walked up to ask him what was going on, and he said Dior's missing, and so we all started looking for him. Do you think his parents had anything to do with his disappearance? No. No, I was the last one to see the kid, and there wasn't that much. Five, ten minutes, they was looking for him themselves. Everyone's going to have to have someone to blame here, you know, and unfortunately, the last person to see him is going to be the one that has the blame, you know. I mean, there's four people in that campground that day. If everyone was that worried about it, the baby should have went with the parents. He chose not to because he wanted to stay with my dad. He wanted candy. This is the campsite where Dior and his family were camping. It looks like your average campsite. You've got a fire pit, a picnic table, very close to the creek that we have heard so much about. In fact, the creek is just here a few yards away. Notice the terrain down to the water. It's very steep. What does your heart tell you about I don't. <laughs> I really don't know what happened to little Dior in my heart or nothing else. No, I don't. I don't. I really don't know what happened to the kid. I don't know how much more you need. It'd be nice to get him back. That's the only thing I can say. We stayed up there until until about you know the uh, the Red Cross left. Until law enforcement told us we could go home. So. And just coincidentally, above where Dior disappeared, above that campsite, there is a large boulder field extending an extraordinary distance. And uh, that would be one of those areas that I'd give an intense look at. According to Oregon State Police, there are 41 missing children in Oregon. One of them is Samuel Belke. He was eight years old when he vanished at Crater Lake six and a half years ago. Crater Lake is a magnificent place. 
uh, the, the first time somebody sees it and the hundredth time somebody sees it, you say, wow. It is a top of a mountain that is blown off uh, thousands of years ago. It was a volcano caldera that filled up with water. The water is the most incredible blue that you can imagine. Knockout beautiful. I've been there dozens of times, maybe a hundred times. It's one of the most foreign places that you can really imagine on Earth. Every trip that I've gone there, it's also a different kind of a mood. Three, two, one. The best news about today's search and rescue effort is, is that the weather is starting. As a news guy, this was a story that was equally frustrating. Some of them just start off bad and they get worse. The way I understand Sammy's disappearance is that he was visiting Crater Lake with his dad, staying at Diamond Lake Resort. Uh, he's got some developmental uh, problems, maybe some, uh, some form of autism on a scale. And while he's at Crater Lake, they are near what's called the Cleetwood Cove Overlook. They got about a quarter mile to the east of the Cleetwood Cove Trail, and they parked, and he kind of went running off. At some point, Sammy crosses the road, and he's up this uh, a scree hill of kind of some rock cut out where the road is there, and there was a cyclist riding by that had stopped to take a photo, and Sammy was getting ready, or looked like he was gonna throw a rock at the cyclist, and the cyclist cautioned him, and uh, Dad was yelling for Sammy to come back, and uh, whether Sammy was just being a boy, or if there was something to do with uh, his condition also. He, uh, he ran the other direction. His dad ran up the hill after him, and uh, he had vanished. It gets very, very cold at Crater Lake this time of the year. I mean, it easily dips down below freezing at night. Uh, and so time was really of the essence. Uh, so beginning at about 6 o'clock Saturday night, we, uh, we started putting searchers into the field. Um, that first night we had up to uh, about 25 searchers, a combination of, um, of foot searchers, uh, search dogs, and tracking teams. That's what we're basing this entire search on. We're searching for, for a live uh, Sammy Belke, uh, perhaps burrowed in under uh, some thick vegetation or found a rock overhang. We were really involved the next day after Sammy went missing. I remember it being a difficult search because of weather. Two feet of snow came in the next day and uh, the park, uh, I think, was overwhelmed with the, the people starting to come in. They, you know, they set up a staging area and now they've got all of this assistance coming to try to help and look. We, uh, we did a limited helicopter search on Saturday morning, and unfortunately the weather has been conspiring against us. And after about six short passes over the search area, the weather socked in, uh, the clouds came in, the rain started, and we weren't able to fly anymore that day. I believe the number that comes to mind was they had 174 people up there from different search and rescue agencies. That included uh, search and rescue units from neighboring counties, helicopters, search dogs. The term we use is last seen point, and that's a, a reference spot usually from where we start our search. Well, this is the area where uh, Sammy was last seen on Saturday. Uh, the ridge behind me uh, with the kind of dirt slope at the top of that ridge was uh, where Sammy was last seen by his father. It appears that a national park is within a county. It really is its very own sovereign place. And so we received a, a phone call that there was a missing child there. And we were very anxious to send searchers. We were uh, wanting to send investigators. 
and uh, the parks often use their own staff uh, initially. They are sometimes an island unto themselves that uh, it's somewhat exclusive jurisdiction. Now we are over 400 national parks in the United States, uh, which uh, is something that uh, we're very proud of. The National Park Service is a unit within the Department of the Interior and uh, within the National Park Service there's a director of the National Parks and the headquarters in Washington DC and then there are regions throughout the United States where uh, they have responsibility over a certain number of the parks. Does the National Park Service keep a list of missing people in their parks? I don't recall. I would have I would have regular briefings on different things that were going on. There were significant national uh, crises where the Secretary of Interior should know. There's a whole agency of 23,000 people that were more involved in the day-to-day -day activity of any given person, uh, any given incident, or any given park. As somebody who's been an avidly outdoor person all my life, it just is unthinkable to me that there's no accountability from our government when it's easy to be accountable, especially in this day and age of technology. Sometimes records are kept and sometimes records are not kept. There's no requirement for the federal government to keep records of people who go missing on federal lands. In today's day and age, we should be collecting as much information as we can and putting it in a, in a database that's, that's open, that's, that's not guarded by anyone. If we want to help find the next lost person, we can learn a lot by what went right in that previous search, what went wrong in that previous search, what would they have done differently, and a good record keeping of a search whether it was successful or not, needs to be on hand so that the next time we go there, the search leader can make informed decisions and use resources very wisely. In the work I do with missing airplanes, we're always trying to look at that missing airplane list. When I was sheriff of Klamath County, I could get my hands on a list of missing people in a matter of minutes. If you have areas that you don't even know there's missing people, if you have uh, you know, specific jurisdictions that don't have that data, it makes it really difficult going back to reinvestigate when more information comes. The reality is that if, say, park authorities were open about how many people are missing from national parks and public parks and wilderness areas, then those of us who are going to shelve our fear and still go out there, we can go out better protected. That's what I think authorities should do. I think they should come clean and say, here's all the information. Now you know, we don't know what's going on, but at least you should protect yourself. It's obviously an unsolved mystery. Um, it's one of those things that it, you kind of carry it in the back of your mind every time that you go and visit Crater Lake. I mean, it's a tourist destination. It's a happy place to be. But you go up there and you do think it's, it's, it's a beautiful place, but it's not without tragedy. The strongest theory, well, there's, there's many, the strongest theory is that he was in those woods somehow and he likely, in my opinion, got covered up by snow and then maybe became victim of an animal later on. I believe that when a child goes missing, that you throw every resource you have at it initially. And I would have liked to have seen that happen with Sammy that night. It is the end of month one, and the search for two-year-old Dior Coons Jr. continues. Many believe Dior isn't on that mountain. Search and rescue and all the townspeople, everybody went out there. Everybody went out there. There's been a lot of people up there looking, a lot, a lot of people. Even after the search was done, there's been people. I think he would have been found if he was, don't you? Several people have mentioned other people that live in Lemhi County. 
There's a woman that, that runs a restaurant there. Some people have said that she may have been involved. The mother and father knew that the baby was dead, so they said, uh, please help us. They paid her $1,000 to dispose of the body. Police have cleared her. There's, I mean, there's so many theories out there. People, you know, oh, you know, the parents did something to him or it was an accident. They said the boy was up there. They just used that as a ruse to say that he's missing, but he was never up there to begin with. Oh, he was there. I seen him play, trying to play in the campfire. He was playing with his dad. Several people have said there's sex offenders that live in town and that maybe they knew this little boy was up there and so that they concocted this plan to go up and take him. They're thinking more like it was somebody kidnapped him. They'd followed him back from Ledor and caught me when I wasn't looking and snatched him. I've heard everything from Bigfoot took Dior to maybe a trucker picked him up, to maybe he's a child sex slave in Canada. A lot of Facebook groups have been set up where anytime any sort of update on Dior is out, they'll post the link and then a hundred people will comment. There's probably a dozen different Facebook pages out there that people have started. And there's a lot of it that's positive support for the family, but there's a lot of it that's just, just condemning. Called them murderers, said they're neglectful parents, that they, they should never have kids. Social media has its upside, but a terrible downside as well. People jumping to conclusions, spreading rumors, and that just complicates the grief so much more. The parents are having to defend themselves at the same time as they're trying to grieve and trying to get their, wrap their arms around the fact that their child is missing. The family's been accused of, of drug use and of sleeping with certain people. Everything from their looks to their demeanor to how they speak. In fact, I even told them, stay off social media. So I said, you want the broadcast media, the print media to be on your side. And whatever comes out, uh, the social media may misinterpret that and say some things that are cruel or not true, but don't even pay attention to them. And it may be that people have become fixated with this case and they're craving something. They want some sort of nugget of news or new information. And when they don't get that, they speculate. And then it spreads and you can't control it. Every time somebody would come around who was part of the media, he would say, well, what blank blank are they doing here? Uh, why are they here? And that bothered me. I said, why would they not want coverage? I knew that they were offered Nancy Grace for an hour. Good Morning America called them and they wouldn't go. It can only help, can't hurt. And at this point, having his face plastered everywhere is how we're gonna find him. You know, every time somebody goes to Walmart, wherever they're at, or get out of their car, I want Dior's face to be in their mind. Hmm. I'm not aware of any manual of how you're supposed to act if your child goes missing, you know, so. Um, it's extremely stressful for them. And then when you have people, you know, trying to make assumptions and, and judgments without a lot of information, that's got to be very difficult. Hi, this is Jessica. Leave me a message and I'll get right back to you. I asked Dior why she was freaking out on me when you told me it was okay. She said, he says, I told Jess and she doesn't like the idea. This is the strangest case that I've worked. Everybody else, they, they plead for uh, television coverage. They plead for uh, radio coverage, newspaper coverage. They plead for this. And that's what's so strange. I'm trying to, why are they acting this way? Are they concealing something? It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who thinks you're a murderer. It doesn't matter who thinks you did what to your son. It matters that you need, we need to find your son.
basically I notified them in writing that because they didn't want to cooperate with the broadcast media or print media that I was going to back out of the case and I withdrew my $20,000 offer of a reward. Uh, one of them uh, didn't really care. The other one said, well, th thanks for giving up on our son. Brantley. Come here, hold this. Go see Brantley. mom for a minute. Come here. Go see mom. Here. Oh, hi, big boy. <laughs> okay. Right here by mommy. What are you watching on YouTube? No. She's not a people person. She's, she's like, oh, look. Yeah, are you going to tell them? Hmm? Uh, no for you. No. Like I said, they just, they, I don't know. You know, I think they cope with it different, and maybe they have different ideas of what is a good idea to help find their son. That's Dior. What the f is going on? What the f are you doing? She's having a f connection fit and everything is fine today. I was, uh, dude, I called you. Didn't I do don't, anything, I called you. you didn't do I anything. Don't. I know. You didn't do anything, babe. You're fine. I, I just want to help. Out. You're fine, honey. She's just going through her shit. You guys need to know something here about when it comes to Jess. She is an amazing person, but she's never been able to handle stress very well. That's my job. That's my half of the relationship. She's fine, but she's not. And a lot of it is Jessica's very impressionable. Yeah. So what she's fine with right now, all she got to do is talk to her mom, and her mom can talk her into doing anything. And if her mom is, I don't trust her mother. I don't trust that Bob and Isaac can have something to do with this. And I don't trust that her mother, Trina, is not trying to hide that as well. So, so you guys did nothing wrong. None of you guys did, and I will fix this. I'm Ed Duckey's mother. I was visiting my parents in uh, Ritter, Oregon, and uh, it was Easter time. Easter came early that year, and so there was there was snow on the grounds, patches of snow on the ground. It was a cattle cattle area, and uh, my uh, parents were ranchers, and uh, the neighbors were pretty much it's also. He was, a, he was a happy child, a very happy child. He and uh, his older brothers had gone to the barn to see a new calf. And it was at lunchtime, and so I called the boys, and the older two came, and Keith didn't. And so I said, oh, where's your brother? And he said, oh, he went around the barn. And so we went to find him, and um, he wasn't there. We were able to start a search immediately for him. It was long before search and rescue was organized like it is today, but they knew how to search, and so they went within speaking distance of each other so that they were able to communicate. They, everyone is just marvelous. We felt that there was about 200 people there. And uh, they searched through the night. I didn't know I didn't know until much later that he had gone through this herd of cattle but they found his footprints Even as the crow flies his journey from his house to where his tracks were found is 3 miles and then his body is found way over here 5 miles away 8 miles in total he was stiff. He, he, his little body couldn't move. He was found face down in the snow, and uh, his little face was scratched pretty bad when we found him. And it was at lunchtime when he had disappeared, and it was uh, about seven o'clock the next morning when he was found. 
eight miles. That's as the crow flies. It's impossible to walk out here as a crow would fly. In the span of less than 24 hours, you'd have to believe that this two-year-old covered perhaps as many as 12 miles. As it was, his clothing was found ripped. And they figure it's likely from barbed wire fences, either going through them or under them. And even with a full moon tonight, I can't see anything going through this bush. So if I'm a two-year-old child and I've got to walk through this or crawl through this, I get to this time of night, I can't see Keith going anywhere. I can't go anywhere. How a two-year-old could travel the topography I'm traveling now, uh, little shoes and, and it was sub freezing temperatures, even if he was a kid full of energy. This is roughly the area the searchers found him. His father was about 100 yards that way. And he's found here, face down in the snow, hat and coat beside him. Searcher finds him, father one, maybe 200 yards away, runs over, picks him up, and he's alive. Over the years, in the Ritter area, when we'd go visit there, someone would come visit and say, oh yeah, I remember we looked for you, you know, and thank goodness you were found. And I said, oh, well, that's great, and thank you for looking. This is the cap that I wore, and it's got little uh, earmuffs on them. And it's my little, little cap. And this here is one of my shoes that I had on. This is my jacket that I was carrying with me. I took it off for whatever reason and I was carrying my my cap and my uh, coat in my hand when I had alongside me as I was laying prone on the ground. I had that in my hand. This here is my uh, shirt that I had and then as you can see on the my bib overalls you can see the tears on them where I caught it in the fence, trying to go through the fence and stuff. And it tore the, and caught the, I've got a tear in the back where the barbed wires caught it and uh, tore it. But those, are, those are the clothes my mom kept for uh, all these years. We just never gave up hope, and, um, and he, he was found. Although he suffered a frostbite in his hands and feet, uh, we were just fortunate that he was found when he was. We never made a big issue of him being lost because we didn't want to, to frighten him and uh, to make him afraid of dark or to be frightened. I felt he'd gone through that. No nightmares about it at all. I don't recall it at all, anything about it. They asked me what happened and I told them I didn't know. I didn't know what happened and they asked me. I had quite a few scratches on my, my uh, face and, and hands and someone asked me how I got those and I told them the cat had scratched me. So I had no recollection uh, of what had happened to me. It's the kind of baffling case that has you sit back and go, nothing that I can put my finger on in a normal set of circumstances in the wilderness makes any sense to this case whatsoever. It's something other. Very quiet now, because that's not usual for him. You get all kinds of little motor noises coming out of there from him, and he's just with his cars and it's usually, very quiet and yeah usually you're stepping on hot wheels or 
Legos or something. The whole house is the same way. The whole house is very quiet now. It's just, it's not a, that's not anywhere a home. You go day by day hoping you can get your life back. Hoping he's okay because this ain't it. This sucks. <laughs> Little man. <laughs> Every day I was happy because I got to spend it with him. I could go to work and take him to work with me and still have that time with him. And then we'd come home and make dinner and give him his bath and put jammies on and watch a little TV and play and then read him a story or sing him a song to put him to sleep and give him about 10 million hugs before I could leave the room. <laughs> and I miss those days a lot. When did the FBI get involved? Um, what was it? About a month? Three, yeah, it was three like weeks a month. To a month three weeks after to he a went month missing. after he went missing. Is when they brought uh, FBI in? The FBI originally called Lamb High County and said, we heard about this case. Do you guys need any assistance? We'll help you out. And they said, yeah, can you handle, like, the forensic part of this? I don't know if he showed you inside his truck. It's an old beat-up truck. There was still on the, the light, the dome light, it was covered with uh, FBI evidence tape. Like, that's one thing they hadn't taken down. So he did let them swap their truck. We were told that a report should come out within um, six to eight weeks, and we're at the eight-week mark now with still no answers. They're coming up with uh, any sort of theory or any sort of hypothesis as to what could have happened with Dior Coons. Yeah, we want them to come back and say we have reason to believe because of this and this right. that he was abducted. So we're now we're looking at this, this individual. Case. We're looking here. We're doing that's. It gives us more of an direction to go in. And people, some people are like, well, they're afraid of the FBI. And uh, no, we are not. I have nothing to hide. I have no. I didn't do anything wrong. Bob's friend Isaac stayed in his own tent. Bob stayed in the camper. Jessica, I, and little Dior stayed in Bob's Suburban. Um, I got out of the Suburban that morning and they were actually, her and my son were already up and out and they were just getting ready to start breakfast. So we decided, okay, well, Bob, what do you, what's the plan? He was gonna, him and Isaac were gonna go fishing. And I said, well, we're gonna go down to Ledore, get a few things and we'll come back up. And he says, well, be back here by one if, if you can. Um, got our groceries and Jessica went to the restroom. I loaded Little Dior in the truck with the groceries and she came out and we headed back up. They'll say it's 45 minutes up and Bob and Isaac were just pulled, uh, coming back into camp because they were fishing down in the creek right by where we were camping and Jessica got Little Dior out. And we parked where that Jeep is right now. My grandpa was sitting in a chair right here and we had our double chair right about in here. And I handed my grandpa the candy that we bought him. Isaac and my grandpa were talking about how they went fishing in the creek and caught fish just down up in there. And we decided that we were gonna go up and look to see if there was fish in the creek. After we decided that we were gonna go up there, I asked my grandpa if it was okay if we could leave little man with him and he said, yeah, he's fine. Um, he wants candy anyways. And he was about ready for due for a nap anyways. And he can tell he was getting, getting pretty tired. So we wanted to leave him with Bob instead of making him walk and all that. So we headed up this road right here, right about where that smaller tree is. We stopped and noticed that little man was following us. So Dior asked him, do you want to go with us or do you want to stay with Grandpa Bob? He said, no, yeah and turned around and started walking back towards my grandpa. So we realized that he was gonna go back to camp with my grandpa, so we headed up. I figured he was with my grandpa, he was fine. And we walked up to the creek and Isaac said that right here, right here, right here is where we were fishing and caught fish and he turned around and walked back towards this way. Dior and I stayed up by the creek and kind of just 
looked in the water and looked to see if we could see any fish. I started getting my fishing gear ready because I figured this was kind of a good spot to fish. And there's one spot that had minnows in it and they were just stuck there. They couldn't get out from the low level and I thought, God, this would be neat for him to see. Um, Jessica stayed at the creek and I walked up the bank and got back up on the bank and went towards camp and I yelled to Bob, where's little Dior? I, I could hear voices up in the camping area and you can actually, where I'm standing right now, you can actually see the table, the picnic table that's in our campground. But I could hear Dior's voice, I just couldn't make out what he was saying. I hollered to him, where's my son? And he says, I don't know. And I said, Bob, where's my son? And he says, he headed up that way towards you guys. I saw somebody walking in between these trees right here, realized that it was Isaac with fishing stuff in his hand and he was walking towards the creek. And then by that time, I had looked back at the creek for a split, like maybe 10 seconds. And by then I heard Dior yelling and I turned around and looked straight across from me and he was right there saying, uh, little man's gone, he's not in the campground, we can't find him. We came up this way asking where my grandpa, where he had gone last time he saw him and he saw him right next to that pine tree kind of sitting down. He, he said he was either playing with the dirt or playing with his shoes. Once I knew that he was missing, that was like what really made me panic is like, I, I don't want him to drown. He's not in the camper, okay? He's not in right in this area. And she started searching by the creek. I'm up and around. We searched for about 20 minutes or so and I didn't hear him. I didn't, we were panicking, we didn't hear him. So we decided we needed to call search, the salmon search and rescue. A lot of what happened just doesn't make sense because he would have, I think he would have screamed or tried to say mama. Within the hour of him being, going missing, it rained and then it got really hot. So he would have taken his jacket off he, and we didn't find anything. That place was scoured. The only thing that I am sure of is that Jessica that day was with me. She, she was with me and I was with her. So the only thing that I know sure of is that she had nothing to do with it, I had nothing to do with it because we were each, with each other. And I was searching the creek and in the water the whole time up until Ray um, Stevens got here with search and rescue and he asked me to come up and sit in the campground. That as a parent is one of the hardest things when you have all these professionals telling you stay at the camp and they have reasonings for that, it's because if they find, if they found my son, then they got to go looking for me. And. Or they didn't and, want us to react, you know, and go after somebody that we thought had right. something to do and with it. And when, when your child goes missing, you're number one suspect. You're, and it's sad, but it's true. You've got grieving parents that are already riled up and you know, you, we've gone through literally the most living hell any parent can think of and then you get hooked up to a machine and the fact is it's it, it's hard you know there was no problems but they they call it a um something pass inconclusive pass you're scared to death you're riled up you're you're scared for your ch your child you're scared for your family your your mind's going in a million different directions and none nothing is ever Nothing but but you don't get any answers out of any of those directions you're going in. And so it's you get hooked up to a machine like that and everybody thinks, well, hook them up to a polygraph. Go ahead. Go right on ahead. I have nothing to hide, but just know that they're not very useful. Well, we still have a missing child. You know, I believe he's still out there and we just haven't found him yet. Uh, you know, everybody wants an answer. Hopefully someday we'll come up with one. You need some newspaper? What are you doing? Working on a documentary for about a little kid that went missing in Lador. Well, the parents killed him. Duh. You know about the case? I know about it. Guess what? He didn't wander off to this Why after the disappearance were you guys both media shy? Everything I said, and, and no matter what I did, you're 
you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. I did not want, I wanted the media to be on my son, not on me, not on Jessica, because that doesn't help find him. Everything I would say would be twisted. Yeah, we were actually, the reason, the whole reason why we haven't been on the news a lot and doing this stuff is because we're actually out there. Like, we've been, I don't even know how many times we, how many hours, how many days, how many weekends, how much money, our money that we have spent just going up there to search for him. But all these people saying their hearsay stuff and saying that, you know, there's something wrong because we're not on the news and this and this and this. No, we're... You're, we're doing right. something I for our son. I didn't want to son. spend all this time in front of the public every day and, and pet the pride of everybody to let them know that I didn't do anything because I know I didn't do anything. I know she didn't do anything. I had one job and I still have that job. Find that little boy. He knew his name was Dior J. Coons and he knew his mama's name was Jessica Mitchell. I just pray that if someone does see him, you know, that they ask. What is your name? Because I believe that he will still be able to tell you. When individuals aren't found on a search and rescue, I can tell you that it's uh, something that you think about regularly. You revisit in your mind. Uh, there's times you go out and look yourself. And uh, some of those cases will haunt you forever. Throughout my tenure as a sheriff, there was nothing more important than keeping communication open with the family. There's only one case in their mind that still exists. And it makes it incredibly important to make sure that they feel that you haven't forgotten that, that uh, somebody's still looking at it. I don't come up here that often. I feel guilty because I feel like, you know, what if, what if my son were up here at the time, you know, I didn't know what happened, where he was, and I felt guilty not coming up, but at the same time, it was just, it was just too painful. It, it was hard comprehending that that was it. You know, I was going down the mountain and I was going home without my son, and it was the, it was the hardest thing I think I've ever done in my life, drive off this mountain. The Big South Trail right here. I've never been up here with snow on a trail. When you come up here and you see the beauty and you think, did my son lose his life up here? I think to myself, gee, Jared, you sure picked a beautiful place to hang out. I don't comprehend an animal getting him. It's too painful. I mean, I, I visualize many times. I visualize him walking down the trail and some stupid cat jumps him. I visualize it a lot of times, but at the same time, I never believe it either. But I still visualize it because that's something that was con constantly thrown on me. I can also imagine that it haunts them for the rest of their lives. They, just the weird circumstances and the fact that they will probably never have an answer to what really happened. I think the natural inclination for all parents and all relatives is they want closure. It's an unknown what happened to these people. 
and it extends far beyond just kids. We're at 1,600 cases, and with every month, there's a new case that comes across my desk that's an exact match for what we've talked about. There's not going to be any one particular person that can shed light onto a lot of the phenomenon that's going on. We're talking about a, a very large, even worldwide collective of information here. Certainly authorities, um, national park authorities, uh, law enforcement authorities, they often have their, their fingers, you know, tapped onto the knowledge that we need, but whether or not we can, we can acquire it from them is another story. When you look at some of these cases, you have to consider possibilities with which we are really uncomfortable. You know, as a rational society, we're uncomfortable thinking about what else could be out there. But some of these situations are so unusual, you have to think beyond the bounds of what's normal, what's a normal explanation for this. I think one of the most impressive was a search in South Dakota. Uh, it was for a little uh, toddler that had wandered away. And this was, uh, I forget, it was January, February. It was cold weather. And we could not get any clues on the little toddler at all. It had been like three days. So we knew it was probably not going to be a good result. Anyway, we were, to make a long story short, coming through some willows and it was all foggy and the dogs were alerting, but we could not come to any, you know, conclusion. And all of a sudden, my dog turned around and just let out a real startled howl, you know, just it was scared. And we turned around and here was this little toddler walking out of the fog with just no, absolutely no clothes on at all. And, uh, and scared all of it. I mean, the other handler and I both went, whoa, you know, just startled us too. And just like the little thing appeared out of nowhere, out of the mist. We suspect because of just the way, you know, dirty and everything, that probably she had been with an animal, had curled up with a, a coyote, or we don't know for sure, and we'll never know. The ultimate possibility is the most disturbing of all, that it's been here as long as humans have been here. Sometimes we can see the remains and sometimes we never get an answer at all. And you had monster trucks and semis. I think the boots that he was wearing were like sixes or five and a half. But every time he wore this, he said he was super fast and he would run everywhere. We deserve to know what happened, but that little boy at least deserves to come home or have closure. Mm -hmm. I, I owe that to at least that much to my little boy, is to at least give him his life back or his closure. <laughs>